Thank you for coming. We're excited to have you. As you know, I like the big room. I'm saying it again. We like to have over 70 people so we can be in the front room. Yeah. Um, really excited about tonight's event, um, Human Center Design. It's a unique topic. It's not something that you hear a lot of, a lot of days, a lot of other opportunities. So, on top of the amazing networking and all the great people that we got to meet today, we also get to learn about a really cool topic. I'm going to cover some of our. Is it not working? Do you guys do this just to mess with it? I literally <laughs> technology. Oh, yeah. It's me. There we go. Got this. Hi, welcome. It's <laughs> 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 part of my. <laughs> Sorry. It's not pre recorded. I'll tell you. It's just part of my comedy routine is to have things not work. Because if it worked, what would be no the of that? No routine. No routine, right? And that wouldn't be funny without our cats. Um, for those of you that came last month and made the announcement, as of March 1st, we are a national organization again. Um, I know, we're really excited. It's been a lot of work for the last few years. Thank you. I did my best. Um, no, it's really cool that we're now back together um, and keeping the brand. So for those of you that don't know, we were founded in 1949 before I was born in Chicago. We had up to 62 chapters. Right before the pandemic, we were at about 32 chapters. In 2017, CompTIA, the certification company, purchased us. They decided they weren't going to make money from us, and our membership didn't fit their certification pass, so they got rid of us and broke up with us. In 2022, we went through a pandemic. Some of the other chapters have that since dissolved and, and didn't make it through the pandemic. We stayed strong and continued to provide you monthly programming. Woo! We have rebuilt and we're now bigger than we were, I think, in 2019. So I've been on the board now for six years and I think 125 members is pretty large for us. Um, but I'm excited to say that we are in all your favorite vacation resort <laughs> um, 10 other cities, which is really cool if you work for a company that has offices in other cities and you have colleagues and coworkers in other cities and you can tell them about your experience in AITP here and invite them to go partake in their local cities. I cannot promise that those other cities are as funny, as fun, and as informative as us, but they're part of our brand now and we're also looking to start new chapters. So I was talking to my Good friend Michelle visiting from Charlotte, that Charlotte's a great city to have another chapter and help us expand out in Charlotte and other chapters. And some of our old friends from our board that have been here for a long time remember the good old days when we were 32 chapters strong. So really good news and exciting news that we are now a national organization. Um, we also launched our new job board as of April Fool's Day. And it's not a joke, it's live. We only have one job on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's there. Got to start somewhere. <laughs> um, but this is a new perk for our members. Um, we know that a lot of the people in our audience in tech and the industry in the last year have been impacted and have lost their jobs. And a lot of people begin networking again because they're in transition and looking for something new. So we want to help those members as well as our corporate members and hiring managers in the room find those talents. So, if you are a company that has open positions in hiring um, or a staffing partner that wants to post your positions on our brand new website, on our job board, on our webpage, um, contact me, president at AITP-RTP.org, and I'd love to talk to you about getting your, it was really easy, I did it, didn't take that long, and even I could figure it out, so we can get started. This is my fabulous team of volunteers that helps put on these events for you every month, over month. Um, I love this team. These are fascinating, intelligent, amazing, hardworking individuals that find great topics, programs, speakers, members, audience people to come in and fill this room. So thank you to this amazing group of, of people. I wouldn't be the queen without them. <laughs> And our MAC is our advisory committee that we meet twice a year. Um, we just met in the spring uh, less than a month ago, a couple weeks ago, before my vacation. Everything before that is now 
gone from my memory. <laughs> so. um, at the Carolina Exotic Car Club, which is really cool, fancy. Thank you, Brooke, for hosting us there if you haven't been. Um, they give us a lot of recommendations about trending topics, speakers, and ideas. Um, if you know a CIO that would be interested in serving on our Mac, we might be um, having two people retiring and moving off, off the Mac and have open positions to be adding to that. Also, these fabulous people will be hosting the tables in the June Mac CIO speed networking mentoring event that we are having. Um, so this is those people, thank you. I saw Ken. Thank you, Ken. I don't know if anyone else on this page is on in the room today. Thank you. These are our upcoming programs. We booked for the first half of the year because we have amazing VPs in charge of our programs and topics. These are the dates. Today we're going to learn about human-centered design with my new friend, Dr. Kenya. Also, May 15th is our third annual Triangle Tech Together event. It's my anniversary. And your anniversary, so come celebrate <laughs> Annabelle's anniversary <laughs> to your company or your husband. AITP. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> between those three organizations, SIM and T-TAC. So there will be about 100 IT people in the room. It's a really great networking event. This year it's at the Sheridan Imperial. Um, we'd love to see you there. And this is a Wednesday at the Sheridan, not a Thursday here. Do not come here <laughs> Thursday, May 16th, because you'll be here, right? But, but no one else. <laughs> <laughs> um, join membership, talk to Brooke, your hand, Brooke, about becoming a member, even a three-month member gets you in to that event. June 13th, I already told you about, see you there, that's back here on our normal second Thursday, and then June 11th is our special summer social because people will be on vacation. July because I can't read. <laughs> um, it wasn't a typo. We're up, we, we spelled it correctly. It's just my reading is not failing. Uh, July 11th, summer social. Carolina Ale House and Bride Creek because Cloud Brewery decided to shut down their Raleigh location on us. So we're moving. So that's a fun spot. And I think we are still looking for a sponsor, a social sponsor to help us out. So if your company has marketing dollars that they want to spend with an amazing IT nonprofit association, and they would like to see a great room full of people on July 11th, please talk to Mark. We have some new members in the room that are going to get to join us next month on May 15th, and that may have taken advantage of our special pricing before our price adjustment on April Wednesday. Um, so Steve, I saw you. Steve, welcome. James. Albert, everyone that's new on this list, Ellen, Sandy, and Morali, raise your hands. Hopefully you made some new friends, got to talk to some people. Welcome. April, my new friend, on the list. And Jose, everyone was on the list. Thank you to our new members. This is how you become a member. We have a couple of different options. We love our guests. Our guests are welcome to all events except May 15th. Um, the three month membership is basically buy two months, get one free. So if you're a guest and you want to be a three month member, try it out. It's really great for our job seekers that are in transition because if you're hoping that you'll only need us for three months before you find a new employer in the room and get a new job. And then you decide to stay. And it's then so awesome. there's this like sticky factor. Yes, there is. <laughs> You're just like, the jokes are so good. <laughs> they are. Coming back, so. Come back for that alone. Yes. It's worth $279 a year. Yes. For 12 meetings, topics, speakers, networking, 
dinner. It's probably cheaper than a night at Good Night's Com or Good yes. Night's so Comedy Club. Yeah. Yeah. And, and way funnier. <laughs> way funnier. Way cleaner. Way cleaner. <laughs> Better food. Um, and if you can't come, you can give your seat to a friend that can attend or would appreciate it. Again, talk to Brooke at membership. I think that the slides get longer, or I get funnier. But um, group members, are, it's our corporate membership. We have four group members now. Um, State Employee Credit Union, my friend Tracy. Blue Cross Blue Shield, friend in the room. Candle Science. Them. And Dexian, I saw her. Yeah, you. you like when I call you out, right? It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is really great for team building, recognition, continuous learning, training, recruitment. If you have jobs that you are trying to hire talent for, um, retention, all those good things. You can talk to one of our corporate members about the value that they've seen in their corporate memberships and talk to Brooke about getting one for your company and hear all the benefits. You can read better than I, so I will not read you that slide. Reminders, because we all get emails from at least one of you in this room every month about how to register or how to register a proxy receipt for a guest. Um, there's a tricky extra screen to confirm that makes your registration actually work that some people I think like get out and think that they're done that haven't like confirmed. That's how you get your name tag printed because you show up on the registration. But early registration and RSVPs help us. It helps us plan for food and seating so we can get the big room. <laughs> and when we're traveling, like next month, we usually have a catering headcount that we have to give earlier. So the procrastinators in this room, look at your calendar and decide if May 15th is gonna work for you. Register now, it is open before you leave here. You can just register really quickly and get it done so you don't forget about it, and on May 14th, you try to register. And all the other things that it says, how to proxy and add your guests and bring a friend. Sponsorship. Again, if your company has marketing dollars and they would like to put it to good use, we would love to partner with you and find a way to add value to your organization, partner with you on what you're trying to achieve, the audience you're trying to get in front of, and look across this room at these fabulous people that might be potential customers or employees of your organization. And there's a lot of different ways that you can um, become a sponsor. And thank you to Corsica, for being our sponsor this year. I don't see anyone in Corsica anymore, but, but they get their name on our fancy spreadsheet every, or PowerPoint, not spreadsheet. Thank God, I don't do spreadsheets. <laughs> um, I, I do spreadsheets worse than PowerPoint, if you could believe that. So um, that's enough about me. Let's talk about Dr. Kenya Muir and her lovely organization. She came to Raleigh, North Carolina for her PhD program at NC State in Human Design Engineering, which is super cool. The psychology in me was really interested in what she had to say, and we're really excited to learn about her. She's currently the CEO of her own company, Lean Beats, so excited to learn more from Kenya. Welcome. And I'm going to transition to your screen. to get in front of the room and uh, you guys look a lot more alive than my students. <laughs> <laughs> I'm starting out on the right foot. So. Okay, so we are here to talk about human-centered systems design, okay? So along the way, I will get through things in 45 minutes or less, but if you have questions, do not hesitate to ask those questions along the way, just in case we run out of time. Get your pens and pencils. I'm still a pencil kind of person. So if you want to write down some little notes, I'll have or take pictures. I have some little tips and tricks for you to take with you as well. 
So human-centered system design, why is it important and what is it, okay? So about seven years ago, when I left my corporate role and decided that I was going to step out on my own, I met with a former IBMer. I was at IBM maybe 20 years after he was, but he was a former IBMer, and so he had to tell the story of when he was a part of an engineering team, and they were tasked with increasing speed, driving down costs, and streamlining the inventory management process. Okay, so they were tasked with coming together and figuring out how do we improve inventory management and how do we do that in a disruptive way. So they churned and churned and trying to figure things out. And then his manager comes and a psychologist shows up. And so they're like, we don't need counseling. Why, why is the psychologist the part of the team now? We're the smart engineers. We don't need this person. Well, as a result of them working together with the psychologist, they figured out how to streamline inventory management, and they were able to envision how you use barcodes for products, okay? And so he told me the story of why what I do is important, and why when you look at systems from a technical perspective, you've also got to consider the human in the loop, okay? So what is human-centered systems design? It's how people interact with systems, and so for me, and I'll keep reminding you of this, the human in the loop is the most important part of your system because the system obviously is more than just the technology, it's what you're trying to do, the people, all those things that relate to one another. Some of you may know human-centered systems design by other names, like user-centered design, user experience, human-computer interaction, et cetera, et cetera. So all these different terms basically sum up to flexible, iterative design. Okay, so when you think about creating solutions, and Marsha and I had a really good conversation earlier, when you think about building systems, you don't want to go into it with a one-and-done attitude. You want to expect that the first time around, you may not get it right. Hopefully in the nuclear industry, you'll get it right. But in most <laughs> industries, you will not get it right the first time around. And that you have to understand that that feedback from your customer will truly influence the design, the implementation, and that sort of thing. So when we think about that iteration or that iterative process that you're going through, a lot of that feedback is coming from your user and you considering what the user understands, the context in their ecosystem, and what impact your system has on that user, okay? So that means that you've got to understand what tasks are they performing. So there's nothing worse than introducing a system to a user and expecting them to fit within that system without truly understanding where does it fit within the context of their ecosystem. Sorry, just a quick question. Uh, you said it's known by different names. Is this also known by IBM Design Thinking? Yes, so this is the foundation of design thinking. So when you think about design thinking, it is a, those of us that come out of academia or that have roots in going through academic programs, Human-centered system design is what then became design thinking, which commercialized that whole process of define, design, iterate, that sort of thing. Good question. So when you also think about this methodology, you have to think about that requirements analysis. Okay, so when we, again, when we put on our engineering hats, we're going to think about those requirements in terms of building a system that works, that's reliable, with as few defects as possible, but you've got to think about those requirements that relate to the user and their interaction or experience with that system. And that also means testing is early and often. Okay? It's not just about testing for defects, but it's also testing with people early and often. This reduces waste. This helps you to get to market faster. Okay? And obviously, you want to iterate when you do that. So when we think about people, each and every one of us in here is very different. This is the tricky part of human-centered system design, is that you have to think about people and their differences, but that they are the most important element in a system. So if we all think about the systems that we create or build today, how many of you work on a system that is not used by a human or that requires human intervention at some point? How many of you? Every single system in this room requires either human intervention or interaction at some point. When you think about your system administrator, they're a human. And as much as they might be technical in nature, you still have to consider their workflow as well. 
you have to also understand their context. So this one is a big one for me. When you think about context, think about yourself. And how many of you can repair cars or motorcycles? How many of you have that skill? Okay. When you think about yourself in the context of someone riding in a car or riding on a motorcycle, is your context different than when you have to repair something on your bike or on your car? So you have to switch your context and how you understand that vehicle and from what perspective are you looking at it? Is it to get from point A to B or is it to fix something? So you always have to understand that user's context to ensure that what you're creating accounts for those different factors within the environment. And finally, we have to think about inclusion, diversity, and differences. How many of you, English is not your first language? Okay, so we have several people in the room where English is not your first language, so when we think about differences from a cultural standpoint, that means that what we understand as native English speakers or our context is from the United States, the way we interpret things or interact with them are going to be different than people coming from somewhere else that have a different context. So when you think about your system and introducing it to a, a native English speaker or a native American, um, and when I say native American, I mean those of us that were born here, that means that you are gonna have a different way in which you interact or expect that system to, to work, okay? So three reasons why it's important. Why do we care about human-centered system design? When we introduce new systems, how many of you have gone through digital transformations or deploying an ERP system in an environment and you recognize that when you introduce that system, it's not just about the new system, it's also primarily about the people and how their job roles change and how the dynamic between the people in that ecosystem change. So when we introduce new technology, we've got to understand that the people in the loop are the ones that are most impacted by that change. And we have to also understand that not only is it about how they interact with the technology, it's how they interact with each other in the same geography, across geographies, so the way in which we communicate with one another changes as well. And you've got to understand that. We also have to think about the fact that now where we are today, the way we interact with technology has changed. Okay, so we used to sit in front of a mainframe computer and we would interact with things through a user interface. Things are no longer that way. So when you think about um, you're in the hospital, you go to get out of the bed because you gotta go to the bathroom, but they told you, lay in that bed, don't get up, call us if you need something. You get up and that sensor goes off and then it triggers a human in another part of that hospital on the floor to let you know, can you get back in the bed? Okay, that is now embedding technology into systems in a way where we're not necessarily interacting with it in a way where it's intentional. It's embedded within that ecosystem. So we've got to understand that because of this, we have to consider all of those factors that we'll cover in a minute around human beings and their interaction with that system and one another. We also have to consider longer term effects. So when we look at the use of phones today, a lot of us are guilty of looking at our phones like this. We always tell our kids, get off the phone. But what are one of the physical effects of us sitting like this on our phone? Has anyone heard the term? Technic, exactly. So a lot of people are now suffering from technic from looking down at their devices for too long. So when you think about that, the way in which we interact with, with this technology also has a physical effect. So you've got to keep that in mind as well. And so when we think about going back to all of the different terminology that's used to reference human-centered system design, we have to think about all of the different fields that are at play. So it's not only engineering or computer science, you also have linguistics, um, cognitive psychology, organizational behavior because of the human component. So all of these things together are what make up human-centered system design. Any questions so far? Any other questions? Okay. So what is human factor? So I, um, it was uh, mentioned in my introduction, I moved here years ago, wanted to be a physical therapist, decided it wasn't for me, then I woke up one day, I don't know why, and I said, I want to go get a PhD. So I want to move to North Carolina to get my PhD. I'm not sure, I still don't know what happened. <laughs> Divine intervention, because I, I really didn't cook that one up. 
So when I decided that I was going to come to North Carolina to go to NC State for WOPAC, I wanted to study human factors. I had an interest in engineering, but I also had an interest in people, okay? And so when we think about human factors, it is the study, essentially the study of work. How many of you have worked with human factors, psychologists or engineers at some point in your career? Yes, okay, good. Um, and so human factors is about the study of work. So when you think about the things that you interact with, even if you're playing a video game, it is work because you are setting out to achieve a goal and you have to go through steps. Same thing that you do at work. One is fun, one may not be. <laughs> okay, but it's all work. So we have to think about in that process of human factors, we care about understanding, number one, understanding your user. So discover what is it that they're doing? What is it that they need? Who are those actors? How do they interact with one another? So all of that ecosystem. From there, you're able to then define what am I going to solve for in that? Okay, so when you think about the solutions you create, and in some cases, you create a solution because it's cool, because you like it as a team, and then you put it in front of your customer, and they're not as excited as you are. Probably because it didn't fit into their workflow or help them achieve a goal, okay? So once you understand them well enough, you can then define what are those requirements or what are those solution options that we want to create. And finally, let's des design some experiences test them early and often, and come up with that solution, okay? Human factors is at the intersection of social sciences, design and engineering, and biological sciences. I was a five-year student in undergrad because I changed my major enough to take classes in all three of these circles. <laughs> so human factors was just right up my alley because it allowed me to integrate all of those different aspects or different fields into one discipline, and so because of that, this allows me and my company to be industry agnostic, okay? The reason we're geeks is because we've got to geek out on a lot of different industries, okay? But it's also good to understand that there is the human component, the technical component, and in a lot of cases, those physical sciences that relate to anatomy and other sorts of things, okay? So when we think about the human in the loop, the three things for me that matter the most are their mental model, their context, and their motivation. So your mental model, for, is, for example, where do you expect to find your toothpaste? In your bathroom. You don't expect to find it in a kitchen drawer. So your mental model is the expectation that I will find this sort of object in this place, okay? So you've got to understand that when you design a system, your user has an expectation of where they will find something. Even though it might make sense to you because you created it or you designed it or you were the architect of that system, doesn't mean that it makes sense to that user, okay? Context, like we talked about earlier, is where is your user or your actors, where are they in context? Are they out in the field and have to account for extreme temperatures? So what does that mean to the system that you create? And finally, motivation. So if the task that's in front of me, I am not motivated to perform, you introducing a system is not gonna motivate me anymore. So you've got to understand what is that motivation and where can I interject a system that will allow the user to be more motivated or to get something done more effectively than they could if they did it manually or with a competitor, okay? So why should we care about human-centered systems design? I have always, throughout my career, worked with engineers, architects, people who create solutions from a technical perspective. And in a lot of cases, it's been a fight of evangelizing the fact that there's a human on the other side or understanding that when we're creating this, we've got to make sure that our user understands before we deploy, that sort of thing. So you've got to ask yourself, why should we care? What makes something well designed? So we all have systems that we work with that we love and that we hate, okay? What makes something well designed is that it makes your effort easier than it was before. It solves a problem. It's easy to learn and you enjoy working with it if it's a really good system, okay? So we've got to think about well designed means that you get this sort of feedback from your user throughout that iterative process. When it's not, 
How many of us, so how often are we likely to talk about things that are well designed? Not very often. Not very often. But when something's poorly designed, we are quick to tell people it's some crap. It doesn't work. I cut myself. I burn myself because they didn't design it in a way that I mean, I'm left handed and so they always mess me up. And so I, I think about those things that are poorly designed and how quickly I'll, I'll talk badly about those. What I've noticed is that just being on the receiving end of something changing, because I'm not necessarily the one doing it together, it's usually the acronym they come up with for the new thing. It usually is the total opposite of what that word means. <laughs> we have a bad thing in Salesforce where they call it smart. And we were like, this is not smart, it's not. come to us because they are either going through churn or waste or their project schedule has slipped and that means their budget has slipped and it goes all the way back to not understanding the customer and defining the right requirements. Okay, so what are the three benefits? More usable products. More usable products means that people can more easily learn them, use them, they become sticky. They want to use them. Financial savings. So has, has everyone in here heard the 110-100 rule? For every dollar spent up front on this type of work, that's $10 that you avoid spending during development, and that's $100 you avoid wasting once you deploy. So you invest that $1 up front, my services don't cost a dollar, but for every dollar you spend, <laughs> you're spending even $100 once you deploy. Okay? So you save money, essentially. Same for systems. So I also um, do expert witness work for some companies where they look at um, products that users use in there the, for a product or a personal injury. And so what I found is that in a lot of cases, it goes back to that person's context and their mental model. And that system may have been deemed safe by the manufacturer, but the user obviously didn't understand. Okay, so you, you gotta keep that in mind. It's Why in German cars? German car. Reverse is forward instead of up drive being forward and backward. It's the, the ships that that, that's, that's, huge. <laughs> that's huge. Why you buy America? That's huge. Hypothetically. So, fun fact that one of my first year of grad school, I learned that human factors started in war, during World War II. Uh, has anyone heard the story about the aircraft pilot? So pilots were flying, and during World War II, they decided to change the design of the aircraft and make whatever lever would allow you to, to uh, accelerate and go up, they changed it so that when you moved the new design, when you moved it in that same direction, you went straight down. And so what happened was all the pilots were crashing. Mm -hmm. And then one survived, and they asked him, what happened? And he explained to them, you redesigned it, but you didn't train us. You didn't inform us and train us around that new design. So when you think about going, and again, that goes back to cultural context. You said German cars. So those cars are designed for a different cultural context that we're not necessarily used to. Okay. So people are hard to read and understand. How many times have you talked to a customer and they say, sure, I would use that. I really like this. This is a really good design. And then you deploy it and they don't use it. <laughs> That's because what people say and what people do don't always align. Okay, so you have to go beyond just talking to people. You have to observe them. And there are things called lean experiments where you put stuff out there, like a landing page, for example, to see do people really give you their currency, like their email address? Are they really going to use it? Are they really going to buy it? Also, you want to make sure you design things for people's tasks and activities. Another thing that makes this hard is Going back to that Venn diagram, understanding the intersection of people, technology, and the subtleties in their interaction, just like that bed sensor. There's a subtlety in that interaction because when I go to the hospital, I am not thinking about the sensor on the bed, thinking about getting well, okay? Designing for people. So this is where I want you to, to take these things away and use them in your everyday design, development, that sort of thing. The ABCs. Okay, so it's ABCS. So we'll go through these really quickly. 
before we go through them, how many of you have a microwave with these controls or, or something like them? A lot, of, that's the same thing I get in class too. They're like, I've seen this microwave. How do you cook something if you want it to be piping hot? Just throw out your answers. Oh, time, five minutes. Time, five minutes. What are some Express other Express cook three. Express cook three. Power level. Power level. Okay, what power level do you have? So you're gonna like cook it, like. How do you pause the timer when the timer's running? How do you pause it? Open the door. You can start. Okay. Okay. Open the door. Open the door. Okay. That works. My yellow Alexa first. What about can I use my timer while I'm cooking? Oh, yeah. oh, okay. so, try. so this wow. is an example of where one system has multiple ways to do something that in some cases can be good, but in other ways, it's not so good because there are capabilities and functionalities on this microwave that some of you have probably never used. I never changed the power level different? And why are they all different? I actually missed this version. My new one is so much I've been learning the whole thing. Where's the green button? Where's the green button? So when we think about the way things are designed, we have to go through this whole process of applying our mental model to this new system and hoping that what we do is correct and that it doesn't turn your food into coal. Okay. So the ABCs. What, when we think about design, and this goes back to being innovative, you want to open things up to all the different possibilities. Once you've understood your customer or your user well enough, what can we design? What's the most likely or most effective way that we can get them something that will help them to get something done? How can we, as a team, make informed decisions about that? And how do we ensure that we are focused on the most design-relevant characteristics of those people? Design-relevant. So that means you've got to understand them well enough to know, does their reach matter? Does that matter for the system? Does it matter if they can read it in bright light? That sort of thing. So when we think about these different characteristics, they can range from physical characteristics to strength, uh, to how often people use a system. So when you think about systems that you use once or twice a year, what is that experience like every time you use it again? Terrible. It's like starting all over again and relearning yeah. how to use it. That's not the goal. How do we also, and I think this is a really, really missed opportunity with a lot of, with a lot of products and solutions, is lending from similar patterns that people enjoy or are used to. So we can sometimes get really locked into what we're focused on in our product and forget that if you can lend from what people do with other products, that really can help you go a long way in getting that learning curve to be smaller for your user. So think about how with devices where you swipe objects on mobile devices, that mimics the way you turn pages on, on books that a lot of us don't read anymore, which are paper books, but we know that, <laughs> move, that, that motion or that movement. That's where you transfer, you allow the user to transfer that motion to a digital object, but they, the, the learning curve is, is small because of that. Okay, And then also, what is their attitude? So if you're working with people who work in a plant, it's really loud, you know, they're, they're not really motivated or interested. You've got to figure out how do I design something that's going to be engaging and that they want to work with. And also their tolerance for error. So are these individuals that if they make an error, they lose their job? So you, that's your responsibility now to understand where can that happen and how I make sure that I avoid building something that can do that. Also learning and those cultural norms and differences, okay? Exactly right. They went about it 
in an ineffective way. So they had to bring in someone else to then come in, do that work that they could have done from the beginning and avoided having to waste time and money. Good example. So ABCs. A is for, who can pronounce that word? Anthropometrics. Yes. So when you think about how many of you work on systems that are hardware and software? Okay, so you have systems where people have to move, they have to use more than just their eyes and their, their hands. And so when you think about that, you have to understand the influence that the way we're structured as humans and also the limitations we have. Has anyone ever had to do manual work where you have to do like constant repetitive actions or motions and how that can cause different physical issues that result? You've got to keep that in mind and understand what are the characteristics of the individuals that are using this system and what are their capabilities and what does our system do to help or hurt that, okay? That makes me think of the Tom Pay pilots that the, the waitresses and waiters have now and how much harder that looks to just lay it down. Correct, correct. And you think about how some of these systems, as much as they might seem like they're building inefficiencies, they're not. Um, when you think about now how doctors have a tablet when they come in to meet with a patient. Um, how many of us really like that? It, 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 it's a little bit obtrusive in that process and you don't expect that they have to ramp up and understand their technology to work with you, the patient. So when we think about anthropometrics, we have to think about the muscle strain, the postures that people have to sustain. What are, how much time do they have to spend bending down, reaching for something, and so you have to consider that when you're designing that system. B is for behavior. So if any pilots in the room? Okay. Okay. So this cockpit scares me when I look at this, and I'm sure it scares a lot of us when you think about all of the different controls and having to understand what those controls do and when do you know if it's on or off, all those different things that you have to understand. And so we have to think about behavior. So when you think about the way different controls are designed, the intent is for people to be able to walk up and understand how to use them. So if you walk up to a soda machine, so there are things called affordances. So when you walk up to a soda machine, it has certain the slot, for example, for change, or the button that looks like the big button that you can compress. Those things help you to understand how to behave when you're interacting with that system. Okay, so when we design things, we've got to keep in mind that you've got to design them in a way where people can understand what they can actually do to work with them, okay? And when this goes wrong is when you have accounted for, accounted for environmental factors, for example. So if you work on designing car consoles and you didn't think about what happens to the legibility when there's a, a, a lot of sun, then the person can't actually use the system, okay? And so you've got to think about these things when you're designing a system and understand that that entire ecosystem or environment matter in that design, okay? And then when there are simple errors, how can people mitigate them and actually take the appropriate action? C is for cognition. This is the fun stuff. All of those things that go on in our head when we process information. So I am tuned into looking at how people take in information through their five senses, what you do to process that information, and then what action do you take? So I like to say inputs, action, outputs. Okay, same thing with systems. Inputs, actions, outputs. So you've got to understand, and not at the cognitive level, but you've got to understand that people are taking in information, doing something with it, aligning it to what they already know, to then act on something. So that means that you have to know how much knowledge do they need to acquire versus what they already have, and what does this mean to what I'm creating? Am I creating something that's re requiring people to learn so much to use it that they can't even get to the value that you've created, okay? And so some of the issues are where to look for information. Going back to the toothpaste example, I don't expect that I have to look in the kitchen drawer for my toothpaste, so you have to expect that people are going to look for things in places that they expect in relation to things that are similar. Okay, so you've got to keep that in mind when you're designing something. And also, another key factor, like I talked about with extreme temperatures, 
you've got to understand, are people working in, in environments or around other people or systems that are going to disrupt or distract from what they're trying to do with your system, okay? So you've got to keep that in mind. Finally, we have social. How many of you work on systems where there is one or, or two or more people that communicate with one another within that system or across different systems? How many of you work on systems like that? Okay, so in most cases, systems have some socio-technical component. That means that people have to communicate with other people in their location, across different locations, across different geographies, and that sort of thing. So you've got to understand what is the what are the different contexts of these individuals and how does your system design either help or hurt their communication, okay? And issues, oops, issues that can disrupt the ability for people to work together from a social standpoint are distractions. And so you have to design the system in a way where you expect that distractions will occur and you create things that will either provide notifications, reminders, flag someone to confirm an action that they're going to take, that sort of thing, okay? All right, so let's look at the design process. Discovery, define, design, test, and then iterate. Okay, this is all, and this goes back to what design thinking that came up earlier. So when we think about design, three components. You wanna think about your users first, which we just talk, talked about. Empirical measurement, so you've got to create something to show people so that they can actually take action with your system and give you some feedback, and then you use that to iterate. Okay, so that's where you then take that feedback and improve upon the design that you've created. So first you have to understand your user, like I mentioned, you've got to get some level of information about what are they doing, who are they doing it with, what is their attitude while they're doing it, what goals are they trying to achieve, what are the ultimate goals of the product or the team that they're working with, and how does your system fit within that as well. And then you want to look at, oops, you want to look at the people specifically. So going back to systems that have multiple users, you have to understand who are the different people doing the work and what are they doing and how do they all work together, okay? What are the things that they're using outside of your system? So for example, I worked with a team where the VP of sales said, I want my team to start using AI in their business intelligence tools so that when they go out to talk to a customer, they have, they have used AI to help them have a more effective conversation about upselling, cross-selling, that sort of thing, okay? What he did not account for is that these were salespeople in a uh, manufacturing capacity. They worked with um, hardware. They sold the faucets and different um, brass fixtures and that kind of thing. So when we spoke to them, they said, A, he doesn't understand that we are not technologists. We are salespeople working to sell plumbing and fixtures. And B, he doesn't understand that we're using other tools, and so asking us to use this BI tool um, and to use it in a way that a technologist would is really far-fetched because we just want somebody to send us a report in a PDF in our email that we can read in the parking lot before we walk into the customer. So thank goodness we talked to his salespeople ahead of him working with that software company to deploy AI because they would have wasted a lot of time and money on something that the salespeople were never gonna use. So we have to also look at workspaces. And in that instance, these individuals were looking at their details in their car in the parking lot before they walked into a, like a Ferguson. They were sitting there and kind of getting the download. And so for them, getting a PDF in their email was perfect and they did not even want to open up another tool. Okay, so understanding that was critical to, to, to confirming that AI was not a solution in that instance. And these are the contextual factors that you can't get from just talking to people. Sometimes you have to actually observe them as well. Okay? When we talk about coming up with concepts, these are just examples. But once you understand your user's workflow, their context, their motivation, you've got to create something that allows you to communicate what you intend for them to do, okay? 
So whether that's a physical prototype or a digital prototype, you've got to create something that allows them to understand what perspective are you coming from and what are you trying to provide to me so that I can actually get something done. Without that, when you talk about ideas, if you think about when someone's described something to you, you have a picture in your head and they have a picture in their head. Those two pictures don't always align. So this is a way in which you communicate. This is our intent. This is what we hope to create. Give us some feedback on that, okay? And don't get too wed to it because they're gonna give you feedback that's gonna change it. So once you've done that, it's now time for you to look at how to evaluate that, okay? So you evaluate it from the standpoint of, does it make sense to you? Does it help you to accomplish a task? Is this something that fits within what you do? And you do that by observing them using it, recording what you see and analyzing that. This is not a demo. This is where a lot of our partners that are technologists want to lean towards demoing and explaining all of the capabilities and the features of something. You think about when you hand over a, a new object to a, a baby or a toddler. They move it around, they'll touch it, they'll drop it, they'll do different things with it to explore, put it in their mouth, they'll explore something and they'll eventually figure out what its intent is or they'll use it in a way that they intend. You wanna go about putting things in front of a customer the same way, give them a chance to figure out what it is, figure out and orient themselves with the different aspects of it to see how would they actually use it if you weren't there, okay? That's the most important part of it. Who knows the difference between user experience and usability? User experience versus usability. Are they the same thing? No? You say no now after I said that, right? <laughs> yes, I love it. User experience is how it makes you feel. In a lot of cases, it's your perception of a whole brand. So we, those of you that are iOS users who use, have Apple products, the user experience is that entire ecosystem of products, your phone, your computer, and blah, blah, blah. You can go to the store, they have all these scary blue shirts. <laughs> and that whole experience is a part of that user experience. Usability, on the other hand, is about getting the job done, okay? Let's say, this, this kind of reminds me of uh, Simon Sinek's Start With Why. Yes, like yes. How are you gonna do it? You do it based on why you're doing it, or you're gonna do it based on the tech? Absolutely, exactly. Usability is about getting the job done. For me, it's about making sure that people can get a job done. You can change the lipstick on the pig. You can deliver it in a nice package with a bow. It should be a positive experience, but most importantly, can they get something done with it? There are also tools that are bare bones. They're not styled. They're very straightforward, but they get the job done, okay? Usability testing, like I mentioned, is where you put that in the hands of your user, let them use it, watch, listen, and learn, don't demo, so that you can get that feedback. And these are the 10 heuristics. So for any product that we come in, or program that we come in to evaluate, there are 10 heuristics. You guys can all do this today, okay? You look at these 10 aspects of your solution, and this will help you to determine how far off you are from having good usability and an experience that your user can actually work with that requires less from the standpoint of your support team, you having to go back and rework things, them calling support, that sort of thing, okay? These 10 heuristics are online. If you just type in usability heuristics, you can get this list online, okay? Once you've identified those usability problems, now you have a list of things to address, okay? You've got to look at what are those low-hanging fruits. Sometimes it's just relabeling something. Some of those things are bigger and require you to go back and put them into your backlog. And in some cases, you have to do significant rework. But this allows you to now have a really nice picture of where the problems lie and what areas you need to address and when. Okay, 
this is your usability testing is one of the cheapest and easiest ways for that 110 100 for you to avoid spending $100 on the back end because you deploy, deployed something that wasn't tested. During usability testing, what you care about the most, can people complete a task? How many errors do they make? Uh, can they get that done in the time? Sometimes it's about time to complete the task. Um, and what do they say about it in terms of their satisfaction? Did they feel like it was something that they expected, they liked using, that sort of thing? You want that kind of feedback as well, okay? Questions about usability testing? How many of you are doing usability testing today? Good. Handful of you, good. Okay, iterative design is where you go back and fix those problems, like I said, by, oops, 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 oops by taking that feedback, making those changes, redeploying, okay? I'm gonna give you a few examples, yes? Before you go on, how would you um, draw a line between usability testing and what happens in a pilot? What happens in a pilot, like a, like a beta? Yeah, well, sometimes, Usability goals mm -hmm. are part of a pilot mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. um, seeing how a customer is using the product um, is your one. Yeah, so a pilot's going to be more of you handing it over to them, whereas usability testing might have, there might be more control around that in terms of you put a set time, somebody's observing what they're doing, where the pilot might be more of, we'll hand it over to you for a month. Yeah and you do some level of recording what you're doing, and then we take that feedback after that point in time. But they're both valuable. You've got to control, just like you would a beta or an alpha, you've got to control that interaction and make sure that you're checking in and getting that feedback incrementally. Okay. All right, so here are a few examples, and then we'll wrap. We were asked to evaluate, how many of you have an ink subscription with your printer, your home printer? Okay, one of you. They got you because we we were looking for people like you uh, a couple of years ago. <laughs> I wish I knew you then. So we had to evaluate that connection that you make between your app and your printer, okay? And so our stakeholder was the app development team and the goals were to evaluate that process of taking your app and connecting it to your device and making sure that whenever you ran out of ink, you could automatically have ink come to your, your house. Are you are you happy with that service? I mean, I have the lowest no. one, but uh, I, I never use all the things that I have on my... See? Service, but, but when I looked at it, I mean, I didn't go micro to do it, but mm -hmm. trying to go out and buy expensive cartridges or whatever, yes. and then what's going to come... Exactly, exactly. And, and a lot of people don't understand that that's the case. And so what we found was they wanted to see where were those challenges or friction in that process. And what we found was for some people, the program offering was good. Just like you said, the printer ink would come a week or two before it, you before you ran out. Some people like that. Some people didn't because they felt like you're sending me too much ink. Or are you watching what I'm printing to know that I'm about to run out of ink? Do you know that I'm printing my divorce papers or something like that? <laughs> and 70% of them experience significant friction in pairing that, that device to that app, okay? So 70% of the people that we went through usability testing. What I like to say is whenever we do a project, we find that people get like more bang for their buck than they'd ever expect because the unintended insights that came out of that was that we found there were hardware, the test config page that came out of the, the printer, was wrong. It didn't even have the right code on it to pair the two devices. And these were printers that were out in Office Depot, Target, Best Buy. They were already out in the market. So there's really nothing that they could do. And their marketing messaging did not align with what people understood in terms of an ink subscription. So you had a, a messaging problem. And so that meant that people were not going to sign up for it as much as you'd like. We only have one person in this room of about 50, 60, 50 people, 40 people, who said that they're using it. I was like, what app? <laughs> See, you didn't know an app. And guess what? For people who already had an account before they signed up for this subscription, they did not know or they did not account for how existing account holders configure. So they only accounted for new printer, new app. 
You didn't think about those that had the existing account, okay? Medical device, so this is a scenario around a medical device company that had a device out in the market that they were selling for $70,000 per device. And what they wanted, the VP of sales came to us and said, we want to understand the workflow better of where our device, they didn't want us to evaluate the device, evaluate how this device fits within the workflow of our user because they're buying the device but they're not using it. And they're spending $70,000 on this device. So what's going on? So what we had to go and do was understand, so this was a device for people who are going into dialysis. So we had to understand the nephrologist that refers you for dialysis, the physician that performs the procedure, then after you have the procedure done where they connect the artery and the vein, then you had to go to have dialysis, okay? What we found in our work was in order to find the patient who was the right candidate for this procedure, the referring physician had to go through a high number of referrals to find the right patient. And there was churn in the process because although the device made things better so that people who had that procedure done no longer have a lump on their arm, so it was more like it just looked normal, when they went to the dialysis techs at the dialysis center, they had never seen that before. So their training in the community college programs didn't account for that. So they would say, go back to your doctor and have your doctor, they didn't do it right. And the doctor would say, we actually did it right. So we found that if, once you find out you're, you're going into, that you need dialysis and you're going into kidney failure, there's no ramp up, there's no education, you're just told, your kidneys are going to fail. So we also found that the patients were not well informed. So in that, the unintended insights were those dialysis techs needed new training. So what we suggested was that their salespeople go out with a mini ultrasound machine and show those techs, because they were already going out in the field frequently, take that little uh, portable ultrasound out there and show them where that connection is. And have your physicians that are using this device and who are the advocates, have them join a community of practice so that they can share with other physicians the value and have the patients take a picture of that anatomy at the doctor's office, circle it with a, a Sharpie so that when they go to the dialysis tech, they can show them where it is. Okay, so these were the things that they didn't expect, but ultimately we were able to help them position it better, figure out what additional training was necessary, that kind of thing. Finally, we had to evaluate a site that was for members of an association. So many of us are members of an association. They had a site where the director of marketing felt like our users are not maximizing the value of this site and they are paying for it or they're dropping off because they're not using it and getting the value out of all the content we have. So when we went through and performed that work, what we found was 95% of the people that were using that site could not find the information they needed, and they were getting lost in the navigation because it was five different systems cobbled together. So when you went to a link, it took you to a new site, and you could not figure out how to get back. What we unfortunately found was that when you don't take the happy path through your application, you can't get back, and that Members needed to manage my stuff. They had so many things that they were looking at and saving that they didn't have anywhere to save it, so they needed a my stuff area. And finally, the site inconsistencies made it hard for them to learn. So these were the unintended things that we were able to address as well. So that is it. I ran through that a lot. <laughs> what questions, if any, do you all have for me? Question. Can we do a little, like, a real quick group activity? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. So you mentioned I've got seven different fields that you mentioned. I'm sure I missed a lot. So what do you what did you guys hear? What fields is she talking about? So you got like BPO, you got project management, program management, the vocabulary that's used across many different fields, right? Yeah. So what ones did you find? Customer success, sales, marketing, sales, marketing, product management. I, I, 
also, good news is, as a speaker, we give you a three-month speaker um, membership. So you get to come on May 15th. Get to come on May 15th. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. Not to her husband or to her husband. I just to clarify that. Um, you have a few more minutes to network and make some more friends and exchange contact info, and we will see you all next month. Register early. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.